I wake up happy, feeling good. But then I get very depressed because I'm living in reality. A lingering, often ill at ease irony is the thread holding Todd Solondz's happiness together. The characters in his film all long for a sense of fulfillment and contentment they'll never be granted because at their core they are inherently unlovable. Whether through their own depravity You think you are fucking something but you are fucking nothing. You are empty, you are a zero, you are a black hole and I'm gonna fuck you so bad you're gonna be coming out of your ears. Emotional instability oh, If only I'd been raped as a child then I would know authenticity but instead or crippling arrested development you think i'm shit well you're wrong because i'm champagne and you're shit these characters are fucked whenever the film springs to mind i also recall how a college professor once introduced himself to a class that i eventually flunked trying to win us over with a joke he laid claim that you never know what goes on behind closed doors and for every hundred or so houses you pass on any given street all over the globe there'll be one person inside fucking their dog. Given the content of happiness you'd probably assume it was one out of every six with the remainder committing everything from paedophilia to necrophilia, incest and all that other good stuff or whilst the next door neighbour listens in with his ear pricked up against the wall, rapidly masturbating as he pops an egg into his arse. While we may never know what goes on behind closed doors, happiness dares to suggest that what we may perceive as perverse Are you all wet? Is your pussy all wet? <clears throat> is actually nothing but the fucking norm. Happiness is the ill sort perversion of the hoi polloi. Degradation is cliched part of the mainstream. Their struggle for connection, the only thing keeping them bound, via their very collective isolation. Oh, I'd always prayed we'd all be wrong, but somehow you'd always just seem so doomed to failure. How often it is, in hindsight, that we always sense something off about any convicted pervert, yet act with total surprise upon initial discovery. But he seemed like such a normal guy. The film begins with the ironically christened Joy as she breaks up with her schmuckcell of a beta boyfriend. Within the awkward silence and candid, emotionally driven riposts that segue into enraged verbal attacks is the foreshadowing of events to come, where any given scene will somehow blend the same awkwardness, desperation and bitterness into a cocktail of the blackest humour. A concoction, at times, you'll not know whether to swill around, spit out, or swallow. Who is your guess? <laughs> oh, oh my god! <laughs> Whilst an ensemble story made up of multiple storylines, the film centres around the three Jordan sisters, Joy, Helen and Trish, and the perverts who either desire to enter their lives or already have, completely unbeknownst to them. Subplots involve their parents, one of their grandsons, a couple of neighbours and, of course, a sleazy, thieving Russian. Where Joy has no love life or career to speak of, Helen is a successful author who harbours a secret, desperate desire to be abused at the hands of a deviant, while Trish, living the American dream, is completely oblivious to the fact that she's married to one. Bill, her psychiatrist husband, who offers to show his son how to masturbate, wants nothing more than to fuck kids the same age as his little one. Before jumping into bunk beds to boink little boys however, the film cheekily gets you on Bill's side by showing us a dream sequence of his where he placidly guns down NPCs at his local park, a fantasy of which a great many of us can truly fucking relate. Salons is a bastard, getting us to root for Bill all before he pulls his pants down Michael Jackson style. In truth, the nuance of his character makes him all the more difficult to watch as we see him trying to be a good father and husband, all while his most depraved yearnings beckon ever closer to his door. When rumours spread about his father being a molester, instead of lying to his son about it, Bill confesses everything, detailing how glorious it was to drug and sodomise his son's little gay best friend. When, when did you ever 
fuck me. No. I jerk off instead. Due to the self-absorbed nature of every character, it's their selfishness that often deprives them from the very happiness they seek. And, just to add to the irony, the only character who does achieve any semblance of contentment is in fact Bill, the most monstrous of all involved, who does find genuine fulfilment by succumbing to his pent-up desires, if only in a fleeting nut. Appropriately enough though, this fly in the ointment of the tail serves to make its all but unpalatable point. You either take what you want and suffer the consequences, or wail and rally against the difficulties of life in perpetual victimhood. In happiness, it's eat or be eaten. Contrasting Bill is Alan, a boring and dumpy client of the psychiatrist, who, in his own mind, is a dirty, no-good pervert, with a taste for calling up random women and masturbating down the phone. Alan thinks he would love nothing more than to fuck Helen until his cum spewed out of her ears, until the opportunity to do so rears its ugly head. When given the chance, he's frozen by his fantasies, unable to act in any way whatsoever. What he wishes to do and be, and who he really is, will always remain separate. This is demonstrated quite literally when he ends up settling for the other, far less desirable next door neighbour down the hall, the plain obese Christina. A woman who does have a genuine affection for Alan, but for whom sex itself is simply disgusting. As for the sisters, the pathetic and naive Joy comes out the best, if only because she tries to do good, despite how miserable she feels herself. Helen is more of a bitch in denial, desperate to feel something she isn't capable of, while Trish is suspiciously oblivious to all the perversion living right under her nose, even after her husband is found out. There's a happy ending for her son Billy though, who, after six months of unsuccessfully fapping, finally busts his first nut. It might only be momentary, but just look at the smile on his little face. That one must have been for daddy. Who's your daddy? You're never quite sure how you're expected to react to a lot of the exploits of the film. My son's a fag. Happiness somehow conveys tenderness within perversion, black comedy alongside realism, and is happy itself to keep you guessing its entire run. As if in cahoots, you and the movie know that these characters are prisoners of their own misery, be it in the workplace or home, clinging to lottery tickets without realising that they've long fucking expired. What they thrive for is completely unattainable. And yet, I suppose that bittersweet realisation is what being human is all about. Somehow believing that things will one day be exactly how we want them to be. And it knows each of us harbour certain desires and kinks we don't even dream of letting others know about. The movie is in complete mockery of the human condition. After all, we're each prisoners of our own minds, regardless of where we go or what we do. The best way to ruin any chance of happiness is to look for it in the first place. Perhaps the underlying message is found in the subplot involving the three sisters' parents, Lenny and Mona. Fed up with his wife of 40 years, Lenny just wants to be alone. Despite being in optimal health for his age and attracting the sexual attention of another woman, Lenny realises he can no longer feel a single emotion for anything or anyone. All he really wants to do is die. And I guess, in the end, that's the one thing we've all got to look forward to. It sure is a miserable life. <laughs>